any any question that takes the other person to a moment in time is likely to get a story mm. so if you ask a why question if i say um or even a how question how, how do you organize customer service here you'll get generalized opinion we organize customer service at a high level kind of opinion if you say tell me about a time when you saw exemplary customer service that takes them to a time and they'll tell you a story. Yep, last week was amazing, Jenny. And then you'll get a story and it's concrete and you'll remember that story and it'll really help you to understand what's going on there. So a question like a when or a where, mm. not a why or a how, but mm. when was the time, when and where was that, that that happened? That takes you to the moment. And then all you have to do with the listening is go, huh, what happened next? Mm. Then what? Who else was there? <laughs> then what happened? You just yeah. you just collecting the story like a reporter almost, right? What's up, party people? Welcome to Tech Society with Alex and John, the biweekly podcast on technology, business, and society. Today, we're talking to one of our good friends and mentors, Mike Adams. Mike is the author of the international bestseller Seven Stories Every Salesperson Must Tell. Mike taught himself the art of storytelling, and he's used it to navigate a successful international sales career across a wide range of industrial sectors and for big companies such as Nokia, Halliburton and Siemens. Since 2014, Mike has been teaching people all over the world how to grow their revenue by leveraging the most important human communication mechanism, storytelling. There are some really compelling takeaways in today's episode, and unsurprisingly, some great stories. Hey guys. Hey Mike, how's Thanks. it going? Good afternoon. It's going great. Long time no see. Well. Yeah, good to see you again. Yeah. <laughs> so you were, you were already COVID prepared then? Yeah, it looks, looks like it. <laughs> well, there's a few things that I did um, for COVID. We were mostly running face-to-face -face training. Mm. And um, so now everything is, is obviously pure online. But some things like I pretty much immediately didn't like about online and the, and the main one is like the sort of tiny little head and the PowerPoint image. Mm. So I've mostly don't use PowerPoint. I mostly use my flip chart right. and, uh, or just get them talking, like getting the people on the call talking is, is much better. And uh, so that's actually, and the result is much better. Like I'm getting much better storytelling from the sales guys when, when I do it virtually than when I was doing it face to face. In fact, it's a huge difference. Really? So, uh, that's a big surprise. So if you so better. I would have told you face to face is better. Yeah. But the difference is, um, so about, about a year ago, I figured out that uh, maybe two years ago, I figured out that um, video message is the best way to practice storytelling. So you basically record a, a story. And if you do it on WhatsApp, you can like listen to it before you send and then delete yeah. it and try again. So you get like the practice. And then you send it and then I can get it any time asynchronously coach it. So, so what we do, we, instead of one full day training, we do four lots of two hours. And then they do their story practice between the sessions. And so I get much, much better engagement. It really works. Wow, interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, is, it is interesting. Do you, do you know why? Like, have you figured out what the, well, the kind of secret? Well, what I know is that, you know, when you go on a training course, it's not about... It's not about the information that you receive. It's about the new learning that you create in your own mind. And you have to actively do that. You have to actively create that new learning. And by actively trying to tell a story and then doing it and sending it, then you really learn it, right? Whereas just receiving the information is, is way too passive. You know, mm. our, our brains are designed for action, physical motion. You know? So we have to, we have to act. That's, that's pretty much me. I, I find I learn better by walking around. Yeah. I yeah. like tactile. I've got, always got something in my hand. I usually, um, I usually use this. Yep. It's a fancy NASA coin made by Australian mint. And I kind of just do this, you know, <laughs> and, but I definitely retain information better when I'm in movement than yeah. when I'm just sitting at a computer. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm a, I'm a, a, a um one of my passions is is, is the neocortex how our brain works yeah. 
and how it relates to deep, deep neural networks. And, and a really interesting feature of the neocortex, you probably know that it's six layers of, of nerve cells, 30 billion, 30 billion neurons with, with very strong cross connectivity between the layer, across layers, which connects sensors, connects our eight sensory groups and very strong vertical connectivity feed forward and feed back. So every little section of the neocortex has feed forward and feed back. So it has like recurrence. But the other really interesting thing is that layers five and six are essentially copies of your movement. So we send copies of how your body's moving to every single part of the neocortex. And if you think about it, you have to subtract your own movement from all of your sensory information to know what's mm. stable in the environment and what you're causing by your own movement. And um, so movement is, is a more important sense than any of the other senses in, in one sense in that it's required for it's required for figuring out what's going on in the environment. We have to know how we're moving. Well, yeah, it definitely applies to me. Yeah. I, see, I see you're standing actually. I, I, well, I that's because I've just been <laughs> delivering training courses and I, I deliver them much better when I'm standing than when I'm sitting down. I, yeah, makes sitting sense. Sitting down is yeah. massive. So storytelling is obviously something you're really big on and I've got your book right here. Good. Um, <laughs> I've actually read it twice now, so I, I, I reread it again, you know, in, in anticipation for us. Good. Speaking, so that's really, really good. Uh, I think it's it's actually probably the best sales book I've got. Most of the other ones are kind of, I would say, old fashioned. <laughs> yeah. You want to tell us a bit about Seven Stories? Well. I should start with a little story, yeah, which which would also include how I how I know Alex for your benefit, John. Interesting. So, I've never heard this one. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, um, and and I will annotate this story for your listeners a little bit. So I'll annotate the story so people know where they are. Right. So when you get good at storytelling, people don't notice that you're telling a story; they just enjoy it. You know. But I'm going to annotate it. So back in 2014. So this is the first thing about stories. We want to say when and where. They happen. So in 2014, I was back in Melbourne uh, and after an international career in sales. I'd been in sales since 96. I'm an electrical engineer by training, but I got into sales. That's another story and a complete accident. But anyway, but I've been selling and, and leading sales teams in different industries living all over the world. So I got to live in Russia and the UK and China and Malaysia and the US. And, but most recently, I've been in Malaysia, came back to Melbourne. And I did a bit of work in Australia with um, big corporations, with Spotless and Motorola. And I was sick of big corporations. I'd had enough of big companies. Um, and I decided I wanted to go out on my own. And about that time, late 2014, I met Alex's mum, Sue, in Perth. And uh, she had a, a business partner, David. And, and the three of us thought that we would see if we could tackle a specific problem and certainly a problem that I was very conscious of as a sales leader, which is how to get salespeople to say the right thing. Salespeople, 90% of the time they're saying the wrong thing. And I think we all know it because we get calls from salespeople and we get emails from salespeople and they instantly turn us off. They almost mm. all turn us off, right? Because we can instantly see, that it's self-serving. The salesperson wants to sell us something. They lead with a pitch almost 99% yeah, of the time. Yeah, it's a straight out pitch, you know? And um, so, and I didn't, you know, at that time in 2014, uh, you know, I had definitely experienced that problem because, you know, I was a sales leader. I had more than a hundred salespeople working for me when I was in Nokia, when I was in Halliburton and Schlumberger, I had a lot of salespeople reporting to me. And I would often go on, I would often go on what we call a sales call. So we'd go and meet an important client that was like the biggest opportunity that sales guy had. So I'd fly into Jakarta or, or wherever, Mumbai, and, and go with my sales guy to meet the client. And, and invariably, my sales guy would just start jumping in too quickly with the technology. We used to call it premature elaboration, right? They would just elaborate <laughs> about their technology before they even like made a connection or got to understand what was going on, right? Hmm. So like a dump. So that was the problem statement, if you like, when we started consulting. We didn't have any business at all. Well, Sue had a business. She had a tender, tender support business, but I didn't have any business. I just wanted to see how we could help. And we started off pretty much training 
what I would call basic questioning and listening skills, which a lot of those books behind me are the classic sales training books. And I think you've read some, Alex. And I've read and plenty. Yeah. But, but, let, let's say the underlying assumption of those books is that you can ask a sequence of questions that will kind of force the client to tell you what's going on and you can find a problem and go, aha, I can solve <laughs> yeah. that problem, right? That's Absolutely. kind of the underlying yeah. assumption of the questioning technique, right? Now, I already knew that that wasn't all that effective and I had some storytelling tools as well. But after about 18 months, we had quite a few Australian clients and I'd, we trained, you know, a couple hundred people probably. And so I decided I wanted to check you know, how effective was this training? So I rang up a bunch of these salespeople, more than 50, and all, I, and I was calling them to find out what they remembered from what we taught them. Mm -hmm. Really interesting conversations. They all remembered me. They were all mm -hmm. very happy to chat. And then a few of them would say something like, you know, I really remember what you taught me this thing. And it'd be something I hadn't taught them at all. <laughs> and then when I asked them, do you remember this? They didn't. They just didn't remember any of the factual stuff that I'd try to teach them. Mm. But what they did remember was some stories that I told them. So they'd tell me back some stories, right? So they easily remembered stories I told them. They also remembered things I hadn't told them and they didn't remember any of the factual stuff I had told them. So then I, then I started configuring the, the, um, the whole training to be storytelling and using storytelling as a problem solving tool. So firstly, the problem of how to connect how to connect and build trust. That's the salesperson's first problem. If you can't have a conversation with a potential buyer, well, you don't even get started, right? Mm -hmm. And then the next problem is how to introduce a new idea because sales is about change. We need to change the buyer's mind. And to do that, we have to, have, we have to help them create a different reality. And stories are how we actually create our reality anyway. That's how our brains work. We create our reality by guessing new knowledge all all new knowledge is guessed and so when you're listening to a story you're trying to guess what happens next and you're guessing and you're trying to anticipate actually creating new knowledge as you do it so we need to be able to tell stories that can allow the buyer to see that they should change and then the final problem that a salesperson has has is to get them to act you have to get them to sign the contract and act and make the change. And that's a different problem because even when people know they should change, it doesn't mean they will change because mm. they're scared to change. Yes. So we have to use, so we can use stories to get over the feeling of fear. And one of the, what stories, so there's a few things about stories. So I've told you a sequence of events. So I've told you about leaving corporate life and starting up with, with Alex's mum, Sue, mm. and, and learning how to teach salespeople anything really <laughs> and <laughs> discovering that storytelling was a way to teach, but also a very effective way to sell. And I'd always done that in my, in my selling often unconsciously telling stories to get across a point. So once we'd figured that out, I mean, that meant the training went a whole lot better in 2018. I, I wrote seven stories, which is, um, Yes. This book that Alex has a copy of, right here. Yep. and uh, oh no! Oh wait, wait, stop! We've ah, lost... like, like, okay, there you go. We lost you for a second again. Yeah, so we went from the uh, holding the book up, and then you cut out again. Okay, very strange. Yeah, and I, I might be that I put my hand up to the mic. Then I don't know if that was a problem. Um, yeah, so that book sold very well. It sold uh, particularly well in the United States, which is the land of salespeople. Absolutely. And, uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, and, and, it's, and it really has uh, increased the visibility of storytelling as a valid way to, to sell. And, and that's what we teach now. And late last year, I joined Anecdote, which is a, an international business storytelling company started in 2004. Not with storytelling, actually. They started with story listening. So there's, there's really three types of story work, storytelling, which most people know, tell a story, mm -hmm. story listening, which is listening in a way that you're trying to get your client to tell you a story, to tell you what's going on. And it's a brilliant way to find out what's really going on. And the third thing is story triggering, which is when you do something that is so story worthy that people <laughs> will tell stories about what you did. <laughs> 
I'll give you a quick example, um, a famous one from technology, which is the story from Hewlett Packard. So HP Hewlett Packard was founded in 1938, and it's kind of a start of another story, right? And um, and Bill Hewlett came into the workshop early in the company's history. They actually they started off making oscilloscopes. That's the equivalent of making gold pans for the gold rush. If you're making oscilloscopes mm. before there was a Silicon Valley in Silicon Valley, we call that good good timing and good place, right? Yeah. And um, he came in on the work on the weekend to work, and the storeroom was locked. So he took a fire axe, smashed the door down, and then he put a sign on the smashed door, and it said, "This door will never be locked again because we trust our people." And that's the kind of thing where a leader does something and people tell stories about it. We trust our people became the tagline of HP mm. and sort of set the values of the company. So the leader or a leader, anybody does something that people tell stories about, that's story triggering and very powerful way to get a message across. So storytelling, story listening and story triggering are the three types of story work. And anecdotes started off story listening, which was capturing stories for culture change in large organizations, and then moved into storytelling. And, and we, we do storytelling for leaders, storytelling for change, and, and storytelling for salespeople. Yeah, so that's kind of my introduction to, uh, to storytelling and using story as a problem solving tool. Mm. I think most of your audience would consider themselves technical, right, Alex? Uh yeah, technical or and in business as well. We have like a, business and technical. Yeah, yeah. 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 One of one of the challenges that technical people have, and I'm in this category as an engineer, <laughs> um, is that we we have a lot of very specific knowledge, mm. and mm, we often right. we often don't appreciate that others don't have that knowledge, and people don't like to say they don't understand what you're saying, mm -hmm. and they just get frustrated with you. Um, yep or they push you away. And so if you've got a lot of specific technical knowledge, storytelling is a fantastic tool for getting other people to understand that knowledge by telling them the story about how we discovered that thing. This is how we learnt that thing. As a little story, it's easy to listen to, and then, they, then your listener can create that knowledge in their own mind. As they're trying to guess how that story goes, they'll create that story in their own mind. And a lot of that's a lot of how we learn science. Like we think we learn science from, from the formula and whatever, but most people could not write down the gravitational, Newton's gravitation equation, but they could tell you that an apple fell on Newton's head, which never happened, but they remember the story. <laughs> they remember the story, but they remember something about gravity and things falling, but they don't really remember the physics, right? We can tell the story of discovery to teach people the concept. So if I write down E equals MC squared, most people, you know, particularly non-scientists, wouldn't really have an idea what that means. But Einstein came up with the idea of the relativity between mass and the speed of light and, and energy mm. when he was walking on the hilltops in Bern with a, with a friend, with a colleague, and they were looking at the clock towers of, of three different villages and imagining the light coming from those, those clocks as each clock struck the hour. And Einstein was thinking, well, would I see those at the same time because they're at different distances away? And he realized that the time has to be the same time. <laughs> so what must change? And speed of lighting, you can't change, right? So this is how he's working out the relativity between time, energy, and speed of light was a flash of insight at that mm. time. So instead of knowing the story about how you get something can really help you understand as well. And, and so those stories in science um, are really, they really help us understand things. And as technical people telling the story of how we got our insight can, can really help the listener to understand. So I've yeah. talked a fair bit. I've told you a connection story and an insight story and a value story, in fact. Um, and, and that's what I teach salespeople. I teach them how to tell a little bit about themselves personally so that the listener can understand that they can trust them and that they're a normal person like them. <laughs> and then we teach them how to tell a success story. So tell a story about another one of your clients who succeeded. How did that happen? 
you know, how did it nearly fail maybe and how did they succeed? Just tell that, that little narrative. Because then the listener can put themselves, what, we, what we're able to do with stories is we're able to imagine ourselves as the character in the story and kind of get the experience of that person. So if I could tell you a story about another person like you that had a problem similar to you and how they solved that problem, you would, you would get that, you would understand it. And it's almost like you had the problem yourself and solved it yourself. It's like the next best thing to, to learning that. Put yourself that making some in sense someone else's like? shoes. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And, and, and as technical people, we have our technical knowledge. Yeah. And we don't realize that a lot of people don't have that knowledge. So we have to teach them how to get, how to know what we know by story. And we I've also realized... have our analytical and reasoning skills. And we're very proud of our logical skills. <laughs> but a lot of people don't have those logical skills. So if we can use story instead, then we can get, we can communicate what we know that much better. When I first read this, I, I realized that I am actually a, a bit of a natural storyteller, but not, I wouldn't say like a tight or practice storyteller, which when you, in business, you can't tell, you can't tell rambling stories that uh, you potentially have three different endings. You have to, it has to kind of fit into the flow of the conversation, right? Like, That's right. It has That's to right. seem natural, but also compact. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And that comes with practice. So, you know, we would like a salesperson to be able to tell their company story. Mm. How did your company come to exist? Why didn't it fail? Because most, most companies fail. <laughs> so why didn't yours? And how did it succeed? And how does it serve its clients going forward? That's a little narrative. You could tell that, you should be able to tell that in a minute or so. Mm -hmm. Most salespeople can't tell that story about their companies. So we, we want them to know that and we want them to practice it so that it's smooth. And you get practice just by, by repetition. And we use video message to practice. And Do you so find that those stories are often better coming from the founder versus the salespeople? Or obviously that's well, a certain size yeah, of the I mean, company, but... Well, this week I've been working with a company that was founded in 1831. So it's wow, sometimes, yeah. <laughs> sometimes difficult to, uh, to get the founder. But uh, um, so it, it very much depends on the company, doesn't it? Mm. So if I'm working with a company that has the founder still accessible, and that's obviously the best source of the story. And then what we'll often do is video the founder telling the story and then make sure the, the salespeople still need to be able to tell that story because that they're not there when, when they're meeting the client. The founder's not there, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so it just depends on the type of company. If you're in a big company, then you can have a very complicated history. And then you need to know how to tell what part of your history that's most relevant to the listener. Is it something worth like, like focus grouping when you actually start to... Uh, create your story you know like a b trials of it and really, you know that's yeah well that's that's an interesting question alex because um i think we we do test our stories um and it's a good idea to test them internally before you try them out on a client but we do we're testing stories all the time and um and what you find is that that's all stories are not equal Mm. there's a big variation in how effective different stories are and they're very context specific so you need to tell the relevant story that's in the context you're in and i'll give you an example of that uh, one of my very first clients back in 2015 is a building services company and they do fire warden training it's quite a big company it's about an 80 million dollar revenue company so they do fire warden training all over australia and the critical issue they have for their salespeople have is Fire warden training is not exactly, it, in my, every state except Queensland, it's not legislated that you have to do it. So it's an, it's a, it's an optional service. You should definitely do it, right? <laughs> but if you were trying to save money, you could not do it. So they get clients who sign up and then don't keep continuing. So their mm. critical issue is, you know, how do, I keep, how do I keep this top of mind when obviously accidents are very, very rare, right? And... Um, so I was teaching their salespeople storytelling and I ended up teaching their general managers storytelling as well. 
And one of the, I met one of the general managers after a couple of years and he said, Mike, there's, there's one story that you told me that I tell every week. Sometimes I tell it every day of the week. And it's the story of a guy called Rick Rascola, who was the fire and security manager for Morgan Stanley Bank at September 11, Tower 2, uh, New York City. And um, this guy is an ex-Vietnam vet took his fire warden training very seriously. And, and, there, and Morgan Stanley is uh, 3,000 people on 20 floors going up to level 88. And um, he would drill them and they had to practice going down the stairs and all that kind of stuff. You know, they'd hate him for it. <laughs> but when the, when the Tower 1 got hit, he, um, uh, he got a message over the Port Authority from the New York Port Authority that everyone should stay in their office. And he's like, no, we're out of here. So he had, each floor had its own fire warden. He had them all drilled and trained and they started evacuating and their tower got hit. They were halfway down. So all the, the lights went out, the whole tower shook and dust and everything coming down the stairwells. And his fire wardens were trained to sing songs and keep everyone calm. And they got them down to the bottom. They did a count. They had 2,980 or something like that, 20 missing. He and some of the fire wardens went back up and he didn't make it. Mm. And um, that story, which is obviously a very emotional story, mm. um, but it's also a story that inspires action. When you tell that story about firewood and training to a property owner who has a high rise building, it has impact. <laughs> and so, so that story for that business in that context is like brilliant. And you mm. just can tell it again and again and again, right? Because you've got a lot of clients and they haven't all heard that story yet. Right? They can at least <laughs> hear it once. So you see that um, that you have to try stories out. Like you said, A, B, test them, and you've got to notice their effect. But that story has huge impact. That story has sold a lot of fire wooden services, right? And, and it's and not even from Australia. Yeah. But it's, I mean, we all remember the, yeah. the, the day it happened. Yeah, it, so. it connects, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. I don't think we actually listed the seven stories. So, yeah, I'll briefly tell them the way to distinguish the stories is by who is the character. Mm -hmm. The first is a story that you tell about something that happened to you, and by way of introduction to uh, to a prospect when you're meeting a client for the first time. We call that a connection story, a personal connection story. I told you I chose to tell you about the time I went from working in a big corporation to going out consulting. It's mm -hmm. kind of like a turning point in my career. Like and an origin could, story. Sorry? Like an origin story, it really. Yeah, like an origin story. It's not, you don't have time to tell you, you know, if you're old like me, you can't tell the story of your whole career because you know, that would <laughs> take forever. The, the, the time target is like a minute and a half, mm -hmm. you know, not longer than that, if you can. Um, so that's the first one. The second one is what we call a key staff story. So I spent most of my sales career selling high technology. And most of that technology, I didn't know enough about it to answer the client's question. So I would have a, a technical expert with me. Now I need to be able to tell the story of that person and pump them up, you know, give them some credibility before they come. So I want to be able to tell the story of that person, right? Yeah. The third also connection story is the company story. How did your company start? How did it succeed? Why didn't it fail? Maybe it nearly did. That story. So those are the first three story types. Then we have stories to change. And the first one is the success story. So we tell the story of somebody else that used our, that changed, that transformed with our products and services. Then our prospect can understand, ah, that's how I change. And they can switch their mind. There's a different way. Mm -hmm. Then we have the insight story. So that was story four. So the insight story is story five. Teaching your, so insight, the definition of insight, the proper definition is, something that your client doesn't know about, but if they did, it would be definitely to their benefit, right? That's commercial insight. It would be their, their commercial benefit to know this thing, but they don't really understand it. The, there's a big problem with that for salespeople. The problem is, if, you know, what do you mean I don't know something about my business? Do you think you know my business better than me? You know, that doesn't sound good, right? Particularly, we call it like the problem of the 12-year-old salesperson and the 50-year-old buyer, right? This young salesperson trying to tell the 50 year old buyer that they've got insight, right? 
So we need to step back and tell the story of how our company learnt that insight. And by teaching the client how we learnt it, they get it, they understand. So that's the insight story. So, and you could also think of the central character in that story as being the researcher or the person that made the discovery. The central character in the success story is your other client, your successful client. And you've got to tell it from their perspective. Story number six, we call the value story. And the, the Hewlett Packard story is a good example. A leader in your organization demonstrating the values of your company. We trust our people. We believe in trusting our people because they will return that trust. That's a value. Most corporations write their values up on big statements in their lobby mm -hmm. and most employees ignore them. That's right. And Everybody ignores them. Yeah. They just ignore them, right? Because they're, they're, they're not real and they all sound the same. It's like lip service, honesty, lip service. integrity. Correct. Mm. So, but okay. when a leader demonstrates your values by their action and it's so demonstrable that a story is made and people tell the story internally around then you communicate values so if you want to communicate values do something that shows the values that make a story and that will communicate the values a simple a simple sales example which i heard from a client last year uh, was a salesperson that told me he took a, a contract in for his ceo to sign it was a reseller agreement. They were a systems integration company and, and it was a, an agreement to resell a particular piece of technology. And um, there was a clause there about a, a commission, a kickback. And the CEO just took his pen out and crossed that clause out and said to the sales guy, we don't accept commissions from our suppliers because that's a potential conflict of interest with our clients. We prefer to be paid by our clients and for them to know that we don't have any other source of income on what we provide to our clients. Do you think that sales guy wasn't telling that story? <laughs> of course he was, right? The CEO was triggering a value story. Our values are honesty and transparency and how we're paid. And that story tells it way better than some words does. Of course. Um, of when course. when uh, we were trying to figure out our you know um, mission statement and values, my my biggest... I, the, where I started from was that I didn't want to sound like the, the company from the office, um, <laughs> yeah, which uh, I'll, I'll read their mission statement. We crusade to create a stable working environment and corporate spirit and to give unlimited opportunity to women and to afford ordinary folk the chance to buy the same things as rich people. We are also committed to nurturing and promulgating wholesome American values. There you go. <laughs> And well, I that thought, deserves to be printed on 72 point <laughs> fonts and stuck on the wall, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it, it like you listen to that and you think that, that could actually be a real mission statement. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they're taken from real ones, you know? That's right. <laughs> and that, I, I, I love that idea of demonstrating your mission statement in actual action and then stories because it resonates. And I'll remember that story. Of course. I've never yeah. remembered a single mission statement in my life. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So, so that's story number six. That's the value story. Mm. And the final, the final story type we call a negotiation teaching story. One of the most difficult things in business is to, is to actually get through a contract negotiation and get a contract signed. And what happens in big corporations, I mean, I've, I've been really fortunate in my career that I've, I've worked on really big deals, like more than hundred million dollar deals. And what you find is that the people that work on those types of deals is very few. It's a tiny, tiny proportion of the population of big corporations know how to do those deals. And therefore, very few people get experience at that. So they don't know what goes on. And the stories about how we get through deadlocks and how we actually negotiate in a way that works are really valuable stories for salespeople and we need to collect them up. So that sort of negotiation teaching story and the character is the successful negotiator. I have a few examples in my book. And if you ever read a book on negotiation, I've yet to come across a book on negotiation that wasn't a storybook. Stories from start to finish. Here's the stories of all the negotiations I had. Failures and successes. You wanna hear from the failures as well. Now, those negotiators will come up with all kinds of frameworks and models and stuff like that. 
but actually it's the stories <laughs> that teach you how to negotiate because you don't you don't can't live long enough to get the experience yourself you'll you'll fluff too many negotiations you have to learn from other people yeah as as an engineer does learning like that like did it bother you at any point because you know engineers tend to learn well at least think they learn better with you know textbooks and dot points yeah i don't know i mean i my personality style is is fairly relational you know like mm. i've always been sort of interested in the conversation and, and how things are said but but i do remember what i was like as an engineer when i started <laughs> in sales in fact i remember going on a sales call with my sales manager it was to a, a company that doesn't exist anymore called fina it's now part of total a french oil company and um the client asked a technical question that I knew the answer to. And it was about some software that I was an expert in. So I just gave him the answer. And I got a bollocking from my boss when we came out of the meeting. He's like, Mike, you'll never do that again. You will say to the client, let me check with my technical expert and I'll get back to you. Then you go back to the technical expert and give him the answer. <laughs> so he, he can call up. Because <laughs> you just lowered your, your status position with the client. You went from being a business person to being the technical expert that knows stuff, you know, and, yeah. and you're now not in the business conversation. That's really difficult for us. Um, yeah. John and I are technical founders, you know, and uh, we still love getting into the, the, the belly of the problem. And, you know, we, we, we constantly have to stop ourselves from engineering the solution in the first meeting, you know, <laughs> stop that. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> No, particularly if you have a team, that what you do is you undermine your team as soon as you do that, right? You yeah. have other experts and you want to involve them. And, and, and there's another problem here. And this problem is critically important to understand. If it's possible for your client to go onto the internet and find a good solution on YouTube or Google or whatever, they don't need you. Hmm. And there are there's a gazillion solutions to problems that have already been solved and they're low value. They're commoditized. So people who sell something that I can just find on YouTube, they're about to be commoditized, right? That's why eBay is, <laughs> you can buy anything online. That's like that. So a true problem doesn't have a ready-made solution. And as soon as you start trying to give a solution in the meeting, you're kind of demoting, the client as well. So if you take the approach that I'm going to problem solve with my client and we're going to together take our combined knowledge, you have knowledge, Mr. Client, of your business and your industry and your problem. And I have knowledge about how to solve similar problems and other problems. And we're pretty good you know, with certain technology. Together, we could solve the problem. That's a much more powerful, and that's a way to get a lot more value out of out of the arrangement as well, because the client knows that you really are doing something that no one else can do, mm. and they couldn't do without you. And it's critically important to understand that, you know, the people talk about solution selling, and that sounds like I've got this solution, I'm going to sell it to you. It's solution good. creation is worth big bucks. Mm -hmm. And it is creating a solution with your client. And that requires a, a, an equal status problem solving attitude to business. That's and a really interesting brilliant. point. Yeah, because often a lot of clients would ask about off the shelf solutions versus, you know, bespoke custom built stuff. And, and uh, our, our focus as a software engineering company is always to to build something that fits them like a glove. It's a custom built solution Correct. to their problems. At the same time, we recommend the off the shelf if we think it's the, If it makes sense. If it's a it solved sense. problem, if it's an easy to solve problem with off the shelf, we want to use that as a component. Yeah. At, least, yes. uh, at least to begin understanding often, yeah. even though there are off the shelf solutions, uh, you need the, the client to actually understand what all the actual compromises are when Correct. you go down that route. Mm. Yes. Um, but and there's, there's, an, there's another angle to this, which is the client's state of mind. Mm. 
So the, the client needs to, it's not good enough that you know the solution to their problem. Mm. They have to create that solution in their own mind. They need to build up what that solution means in their own mind. And that is a piece of creation as important as the technical solution. So you've got to take them along for that journey. Storytelling really helps for that. You've got to really make sure they understand and that they get that level of understanding of how we're solving the problem with them. And you can easily solve the wrong problem if you're not taking them along carefully for the ride, right? That they really understand that. Would that be a way to, yeah, so we're in a meeting and we understand the problem and we instantly want to jump to the technical solution. Obviously, we, we don't actually do that anymore. <laughs> we, we've bettered ourselves. But is that an opportunity to then create a story around the potential solution you would, you would create and, and tell that? Like, does a story have to be about something that's happened? Or can you tell a story that is almost... Take one on the spot. Uh, well, like a, like a premonition. I, I can't think of the right word. You know, it's uh, yeah. We call those future stories. Future mm. stories. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You can, you can tell a story that says we started here, and we've tried this and this and this, and we and we built it this way, and our expectation is it's going to work like that, and in the future it'll be like that, mm-hmm. and, and that's what we're mapping to, and here's how we're going to check that we're actually going on that path, because. One of the things about creating a solution, um, particularly where you need to create new knowledge, and I think you guys and your audience are in that situation, you need to create new knowledge, Mm -hmm. is that there's no guaranteed way to do that. There's only one way to create new knowledge. We have to guess at a solution and then we have to critically check whether it works. This is courtesy of Karl Popper, if you want to read some philosophies. Karl Popper was the philosopher that figured that out. Guess and check doesn't sound very scientific, but that's exactly how science works. Yeah. We use fancy terms like conjecture and hypothesis. But yeah. it's, it's guess. Guess, guess to refine. It's guess yeah. and check, critically check. So when you provide a solution and you say to the client, look, you know, this is the solution that we think is going to work for you. And here's how we're going to check that it's working as we go through. Here's how we're going to criticize that solution to make sure it's really what you need so that you're getting your outcome. So that kind of process is a step-by-step story. It's, you know, we're, we're here, we've, we're, we've created this solution, this is where it's gonna go, this is what we expect is gonna happen, here's, here's how we're gonna check that that is going on and that happening. And at another point in the future, we may wanna reorient, change how that thing goes. Anyone that likes to make out that they know the future <laughs> is kidding themselves. And and there's a very simple reason why you cannot predict the future. Um, And that is that we cannot predict the creation of new knowledge. It it is theoretically impossible. And and therefore it's a mug's game to predict predict the future. And we should be open with our clients about that. We should be open about what we know and what we can't know. Any salesperson who makes promises is, (laughs) is... Is, is, and, and that's a really common problem, isn't it, Alex? Mm. Overpromise. Yeah. Yeah. It's I, don't think, I don't think clients buy it. I mean, maybe there's a certain kind of buyer that wants to just be told this is definitely going to work. Mm. I am much more persuaded by the salesperson that will tell me, all right, we're in new territory here. Yeah. You think this is going to work? And here's how we're going to check along the way that it's really working for you. And here's how we're going to make sure you get your outcome. I would much rather hear that from the well, salesperson any intelligent client already even half understands the risks and yes. you would assume that they would be more comfortable with someone who a hundred percent understands the risks. Yeah. Yes, that's right. And, and a lot of the time the risks are only quantifiable as you go along. Mm. Right. So you make a commitment to move in a certain direction. And then you reconfigure a bit when you see how the risks really are paying out, right? And that's a valid way to proceed. I mean, I, you know, we often, if you think you can plan everything out all the way through to the future, well, you know, 
Coronavirus I, I, turns up and messes yeah. up your plan. <laughs> no, no plan survives contact with the enemy. That's I, it. I always yeah, like exactly. to quote. Was it Mike Tyson? No, I was, I was going to say, I, I, like, I like to quote a potentially not very popular person, uh, Donald Rumsfeld. You know, the, uh, as we know, there are known knowns. There are things we know that we know. There are known unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we know we don't know. And then, of course, there are unknown unknowns. <laughs> On the surface, it sounds ridiculous, but you put some thought into it. And the unknown unknowns are the, they're the, they're the COVID-19s popping up suddenly yeah mm. but you know that the the thing that trips you up the most is the thing that you think you know that isn't true mm. and this and i'm going to give you a little demonstration this uh -huh. this is a two-piece jigsaw puzzle each piece looks like that okay like a parallel the, the, i don't know if you can see it very well yeah it yeah we very, can. Yeah, can you see it now yeah, yeah. This thing only fits together. You've got to make a regular shape. And if you put the two squares together, you get a regular tetrahedron. There's a problem with this thing. If I show you the square, the square looks like a rectangle. Mm. The reason it looks like a rectangle is it's an optical illusion. Those little triangular points stretch the, stretch the visual appearance out. So if I hold it like that, it still looks like a rectangle. Yeah. You're not going to match two rectangles together because you think they're rectangles. So you think they're rectangles and they're not. They're actually squares. And this puzzle is fiendishly difficult. And the more educated you are, the less likely you are to solve that puzzle. <laughs> and, and, and so you solve it by guess and check. You solve it by trying to just guess which faces fit together. And there's only Brute like three, three, three different types of faces. But you don't twist it the other way on the square because you think it's a rectangle. And that is a killer of a bloody two-piece jigsaw puzzle right there. You know, um, you are you are damned by a wrong assumption. And it's really interesting. <laughs> it's all about how you handle that wrong assumption once you find out as well. Yeah, so. eventually in frustration, you twist it that way and go, oh, and yeah. it's obvious. Right? That's the other thing about knowledge. As soon as you get the new knowledge, in hindsight, it's just obvious, right? It's mm -hmm. So obvious, right? But the creative step to get there, that's not, that's not so easy. <laughs> to change the subject almost completely, sure. but to go back to um, your engineering background, would you say that being an engineer or at least starting, beginning as an engineer, helped you or hindered you? It's a pretty open question. Yeah. I apologize yeah. for that. Look, um, <laughs> I, I had a, I started in sales in 1996. So I'd already been working 10 years in, as an engineer before that. And I was working in software engineering. I was actually using, I was actually working on one of the very early uh, neural networks for rock classification in wow. the mid nineties. And they didn't work at all. And the computing power wasn't anywhere near enough and all that kind of thing. Was, I was working on really interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was working on this new software that we wanted to sell. So the reason I got in as a salesperson was I was one of the few people that knew how that software worked. And I think that it was a definite advantage, confidence wise, to understand the technology and to be able to think like, it's okay, I can go and talk about this thing. So I think there was an undoubted strength to, be, to know what I was talking about. And I think clients like that too. Mm -hmm. The problem I had to overcome was trying to solve my clients' problems before I had their permission, before they understood what their problem really was. And, and you know, them taking them through that process of seeing that's a problem and seeing how this can be a solution. I was terrible at that for many years. And I kind of came across storytelling a little bit by accident and found how valuable it was. And I started actually using storytelling in marketing, not in sales. So, yeah, so I don't know, Alex. I think nobody sits on the mat in primary school and puts their hand up and says they're going to be a salesperson when they grow up. Um, <laughs> so everyone that ends up in sales gets there by accident or, you know, absolutely having to do it because if they don't sell this thing, they're not going to make any money. So people get come into sales from all kinds of directions. It's a very difficult thing to do well, very difficult to do well. It's really difficult to distinguish between 
good skill and good luck because you can just meet someone who needs to buy and it doesn't matter how bad you are as a salesperson <laughs> they're going to buy that thing right yeah. and you can easily mistake that for your skill and not realize that you're not good at it so and there's almost no other job like that i reckon general in a war is the only other job like that where a whole lot of stuff happens that's down to chance really uh, and yes you could be very well prepared or you could be unlucky and yeah i think i was pretty lucky actually in my first year i wrote about that in my book how lucky i was but uh, yeah so you know it's a difficult thing to do well it's very yeah. very difficult to repeatedly do well in sales what i did go from industry to industry is pretty much unheard of uh, very few people can do that and only if you find a pattern and a, and a you know a way to to repeat now that you in in some ways actually sell to sales people are they I easier do. In or fact, i sell to sales trainers <laughs> yeah are they easier <laughs> or harder to sell to <laughs> sales sales leaders and sales well sales leaders are hard to sell to because they're distracted like you wouldn't believe they have a very difficult job they have to kind of tell stories to the boss that everything's fine while they're panicking below their sales guys can't sell right so that sales leader job is a lonely lonely position and most most sales leaders are in the process of being fired even if they don't know it because <laughs> they they oversell themselves into the job usually yep i can manage it and so they set an expectation and they can't manage it because it's really difficult to diagnose what's going on with sales teams and what's the market and what's the skill of their people. And it's a tough, tough job. So, but then sales trainers are different again. Sales trainers are um, an interesting bunch. I think most people get into sales training because they would like to be better at selling themselves. I think I was in that category. You know, I suppose I'm, I'm in sales training because I'm curious about what works and what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, I'll tell you a little story, which is not very complimentary to us sales trainers. The last, the last job that I had in commercial job that I had leading sales team was working in a safety company. And it's mostly a B2C business. It's mostly a retail company, but we had about 30 B2B salespeople and we were selling large contracts to, to big companies. And these guys had never had any training whatsoever. And I, didn't want to train them and, and there were a lot of other problems with that company but anyway but i so I went, I went out i wanted to hire a sales trainer for that team and i was curious about what these sales trainers would be like because i already had an interest in sales training myself so i made a list of 20 from the internet um you know australian based and uh, this was my this is my buying process i sent them all an email and i said i want you to call me between this time we'll have a chat and if the call goes well with that chat, I'll proceed with the meeting. So I had 20 conversations and of those two took any interest in what my, why I wanted to train the salespeople. Wow. The other 18 wanted to tell me how great their, their sales training was. And that's not good, right? That, that's no. bad. And that's like the same ratio of how bad salespeople are in general as well, right? So that tells you that just because you are in the game as an expert, you can still fall in the trap of not selling very well. And I, I know I fall into it myself. You know, I can easily fall into that trap. And I put the phone down and go, man, what, what the hell were you saying? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's not an easy job. Mm. Yeah. But that's who I deal with now mostly is sales trainers and, and our partners in anecdotes. So my job now really is to get our storytelling program which is in a beautiful um, look at this. This is one of the beauties of anecdote. The, uh, the the quality of this workbook is just amazing. Um, um, nice. So we get our partners to sell the program. So the how to teach salespeople storytelling and how to get them story listening, we sell through our partner network. And those partners are sales trainers, and they're the people I'm selling to. So I'm the seller to the sell sales trainer. Story listening is, is really interesting to me. And I, I saw the value in that straight away. Yes. Any quick tips to trigger someone to tell you their story? Yes. Yes. And it's the opposite of what all the books on the, op on the behind me tell you to do in terms of questions. <laughs> any, any question that takes the 
other person to a moment in time is likely to get a story. Mm. So if you ask a why question, if I say, um, or even a how question, how, how do you organize customer service here? You'll get generalized opinion. We organize customer service at a high level kind of opinion. If you say, tell me about a time when you saw exemplary customer service, that takes them to a time and they'll tell you a story. Yep, last week was amazing, Jenny. And then you'll get a story and it's concrete and you'll remember that story and it'll really help you to understand what's going on there. So a question like a when or a where, mm. not a why or a how, but mm. when was the time, when and where was that, that that happened? That takes you to the moment. And then all you have to do with the listening is go, huh, what happened next? Mm. Then what, who else was there? <laughs> then what happened? You're just, you're just collecting the story like a reporter almost, right? One of the like consistent messages that we get from every single business expert and, in, and um, intellectual that's been on our show is active listening. So I've been married, Alex, for uh, 27 years. Wow, that's impressive. And my wife will tell you I'm a terrible listener. <laughs> Mike doesn't listen. But you know what happens in a stable long-term relationship is you start to be able to predict exactly what the other person's going to say. And when I can predict what you're going to say, guess what your brain does? It switches off. Mm. I, I don't listen. So, you know, we get into that situation where we're kind of half listening and our brain's going somewhere else. If you want someone to, if you want to listen to someone, get them onto an interesting conversation that you would like to listen to. In other words, get them telling you a story that you don't know how it's going to go. Uh -huh. mm. Then what happened? So one of the keys to actually listening is to get the other person to be more interesting. An opinion is not very interesting and generalizations are not very interesting, mm. but actual things that happened are super interesting. All right. We won't take up much more of your time. I like to end on a kind of light hearted. Sure. Um, so what's, what's your funniest experience with the you know, sales storytelling? You know? <laughs> well, I'll tell you about, I spent two years, two years selling in Russia and, um, and business businesses transacted in Russia over vodka. <laughs> and, um, and I was, I was at a gas conference in a city called Salikart, which is on the Arctic Circle in West Ooh. Siberia, three hours flight from Moscow, and, um, and was midwinter. So our hotel was on the other side of the Ob River, which was a three kilometer drive over the ice. And, um, and we had uh, a big event there and we had drinking every night. And, um, and I got to know the, the governor quite well through that whole process. And when it was time to come home, I was really suffering. I was suffering because when you're the guest of honor, you get all the toasts and all the rest of it. And it's six in the morning flight. And um, <laughs> the, um, we got out to the airport. And I'm thinking, thank, thank, thank God this is all over. And we got into the, at the airport, there was a guy there waiting with a box, a gift for me and, and my boss who troubled with me. And it was a box of fish, salmon. Say, oh, thanks very much. Come this way to the VIP waiting room at the airport, Salicard Airport. And we're like, look, we'd love to, but we've got to catch our plane. Don't worry, the plane will wait. And we got into the VIP train, which wasn't, wasn't much of a room. And the governor's there with a tray of cognacs, six in the morning. And um, we're like, yeah, we'd love to have a drink with you, but you know, plane uh, on the runway. No, no, the plane will wait. <laughs> and we continue, <laughs> continue drinking cognac at six in the morning. And eventually he said, well, you've got to get on the plane. And the bus, there was a bus out to the plane. That, that had already gone and, and finished. So we got into his uh, Toyota Land Cruiser and got driven out to the plane. He got on the plane with us. And I thought, if this guy is flying with us to Moscow, I will die. Right? I will just be an alcoholic death in my seat. Right? <laughs> Fortunately, he got off the plane and I collapsed. And uh, yeah, so that's a, a story from how you, how you sell in some parts of the world. <laughs> you gotta take one for the team <laughs> taking one for the team exactly <laughs> cool <laughs> alright thanks Mike Good thanks again Mike yeah Cheers, have a great guys. have a great weekend 
You've made it to the end of another episode of Tech Society. Thank you for listening. After speaking with Mike, we actually had some revelations about how we conduct sales within our own business, Ninja Software. I hope today's podcast had the same impact on you. So if anything Mike has said today sparked a revelation in you, I'd love to know what it was. So tweet us any questions or comments on today's episode at Tech Society. We'll read it and respond to every single one. If you want to know more about Mike's techniques, you can find his book on storytelling at thestoryleader.com. I highly recommend you pick it up. Make sure you head on over to our website, techsociety.fm. Sign up to our weekly newsletter. I can't stress this enough. We promise we'll provide your inbox real value. Today's episode, lovingly sponsored by Ninja Software.